This textile mill in the industrial Midlands of England was built in 1870. Steam power, a museum piece of ancient industrial design. It's still in use, competing for world markets. A triumph of 19th century engineering in an age of high-speed production and penny-splitting foreign competition. But British industry, that Victorian brass foundry to the world, is still seen by British industry to be a storehouse of genius. And if the Germans and Japanese and Americans insist on updating and automating, well, so be it. If it's British, it's best. No matter that it can't be delivered on time, no matter spare parts are unobtainable, no matter that it's twice the price. Time seems to be running out. Labor and capital have been on strike against each other for decades, one consolidating power rather than working, the other preferring investment abroad to reinvestment in new plant at home. And the government seems incapable of any action but more taxation. Britain is going broke and it seems beyond the power or interest of individuals to help. It now takes two Britons to produce as much as one American or one German or one Dane. Britain brought the world the Industrial Revolution and trade unions and the welfare state, and now is the first nation to suffer the sickness of the post-industrial age. That yearning for an unspecified future or irretrievable past. What cannot be born is the present and you can see the sickness in the parts of Britain you never see. In the derelict factories in Wigan or Blackburn, in Batley or Huddersfield, in Bradford or Oldham or Smethwick. This was the British Empire, iron and brass and steam, not the plumage and the viceroys. It was science and engineering that conquered those distant markets, not just armies and fleets. Well, all that's gone for good. No more empire to exploit and supply and protect. What's left is a very expensive state at home to doctor and feed and house and pamper. The great British welfare state. The socialist dream has been described as the world's most expensive banana republic. A better life for more people. But the best of it, the health plan and pensions, is being buried by the worst, by the sheer weight of the bureaucracy. It's costing itself a fortune. Doctors are leaving the country discouraged, while the official policy of the Labour Party is to increase the bureaucracy, eliminating the last remnants of private hospital care. One Briton in four now works for the government, one-fourth of the entire labour force on the government payroll, and there's every sign the numbers will increase. This brave new world sees you from the cradle to the grave, with not much for you to do in between, but fill in the proper forms. What we looked at first of all was your supplementary benefit, and to get it you have to register at the employment exchange. That's right, yeah. yeah. And you register as a disabled person as a result of your hmm. accident, don't you? Then we had a look at the fact that you are disabled and your wife is ill, hmm. and uh, you get prescriptions practically every week, either you or your wife. Oh yeah, it might be twice a week. Mm. And you were going to chemist and pain for them, weren't you? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so then we thought we would apply for an exemption certificate so that you just had to produce that to the chemist and you wouldn't have to pay at all. That's right, I got it, yeah, that's right. The other thing which you've come in about today is, of course, your special hardship allowance. Yes. As a result of your industrial accident, you, you can't go back to doing the same kind of no, work. That's right. The order book that you've got runs up to January, and then there's a card in it which you have to fill in about November time mm -hmm. to make another claim. I think you better come in and see me when you get to that card, All and right. then I'll help you to complete it. Okay, thank you very much. To make much. sure that you still claim it. Thank you. England has no way of life. It is simply a collection of people who have been encouraged to believe that there is such a thing as the state, and this state will, in all circumstances, look after them educate their children, provide them with houses, to feed and clothe them if they're unfortunate enough to be out of work, and produce an ever-rising standard of life without their having to do anything particular to achieve this. Malcolm Muggeridge has been chronicling the British condition for most of his life, a condition that he feels has gone from serious to critical. 
and suddenly, really out of the blue, because they'd been greatly lied to, remember, by both the right and the left politically, they haven't been told the truth ever, they suddenly are told that this can't be anymore. We can't do this. Our whole economy's run down. Everything's going bankrupt. But there's little evidence that the message is getting through. This was Great Britain last summer. The loveliest, they said, since 1939. Or was it 1914? It was difficult to take the news of economic disaster seriously. Maybe individuals do not even understand such news. The strikes, the devalued money, the bankruptcies and unemployment. It's all just too bad to be true. <laughs> This is Nicholas Woolley, and among today's PM reports, rail fares are going up for the third time in 12 months. Gloomy news today for people looking for jobs in East Kent. With unemployment rising, the number of vacancies has dropped to only about half the figure available. The pound plummeted to its lowest level against most foreign currencies. There's a forecast that three million people will be unemployed by 19... BBC Radio News at 12 o'clock. Another sharp rise in unemployment. The latest... British Leyland shares have been suspended on the stock exchange at the company's request. Apparently, the aim is to end speculation before a common statement tomorrow. The British Steel Corporation have announced that they want drastic cuts in the labour force. On the business front generally, unemployment is suddenly a lot worse. Not far from the million. More trouble at Forge in Dagenham. 1,200 workers in the body plant have been laid off because of a walkout by 18 door hangers over a many... Grave diggers in Southwark have joined the borough-wide strike by their fellow transport and general workers, the dustmen. And this, according to local undertakers, is creating new problems. Britain's great brain, its technical genius, is still there. But there's a strain of deep bitterness that somehow history has let the old team down, that the genius no longer pays off. Scientific creativity does not translate itself into jobs and exports. Ideas, from the jet engine to radar to television, get exported, but not the goods. The goods often come too soon or too late. The world wants their science, not their product. Somehow they misread the trend. Until quite recently, Britain dominated the world motorcycle market. Today, they're practically out of it. The biggest manufacturer was saved by the government, just to keep the workers employed. A London dealer explains how it happened. We are one of England's largest motorcycle dealers. Nine out of ten motorcycles that we sell are foreign. Now, perhaps this is the reason why. Let me show you how to start an average British motorcycle. Now I'll start a Japanese motorcycle. A market lost for the want of a starter button. Just 25 years ago, Britain was the world's biggest exporter of cars, bigger than Detroit on the world market. Now she can barely hold on to her own market. British-made cars stack up waiting for buyers, while four out of ten cars on British roads are imports. The British subsidiary of Chrysler, plagued by labor disputes, has slowly gone to rot. In six months last year, Chrysler lost more than $30 million. The government finally injected $326 million just to keep people working. The giant of the auto industry is British Leyland. When Leyland is not strike-bound, it makes just about every British car you've ever heard of. It was losing a million dollars a day last summer when the government stepped in and took over. It will take six billion dollars to make Leyland competitive. Maybe. British Steel, completely nationalized eight years ago, is still losing 12 million dollars a day. Nationalization of the steel industry, like the railroads, is part of socialist doctrine. 
But in other areas of the economy, nationalization is just happening through the inefficiency of private enterprise. So now the government is sole owner or part owner of scores of industries, from computers to the sugar business, from airplane engines to those motorbikes. And it's about to go into the oil business. For a time, it was thought that North Sea oil would be the bonanza that would save Britain from bankruptcy. But American oil men got the exploration rights from Britain for a song. The steel pipe being used is almost all Japanese. The oil rigs and platforms mostly come from Norway. The British government has announced it will claim a 51% share of the actual oil. But by the time all the costs have been sorted out, it could become just another marginal enterprise as far as Great Britain is concerned. If the aim of British socialism was to share the wealth, then the tragedy of British socialism may be that bankruptcy will occur before the new Jerusalem rises from the ashes of the old hell. Great stretches of Britain have not been touched by the economic planners, and maybe they never will. And again, you can see it in all those parts of Britain you never see. In the industrial Midlands, in the northeast of England, and if you want to, even in London. In the upper reaches of Paddington and the lower reaches of Westminster. The toiletless, heatless, refugee London. Disraeli, the great reformer, said it, and so did Lenin, the great revolutionary. Two nations. Britain is two nations. In the welfare state, there are still nearly three million people living in houses that lack either heat or plumbing. A million houses, unfit for habitation, but lived in nevertheless. In some sad and crazy way, progress in Britain is a thing of the past. 1875, not 1975. Just imagine this nation and this people a hundred years ago, the pinnacle of military and industrial and economic power, and the pinnacle of pride. To be born a Briton, they said, was to have won first prize in the lottery of life, no matter what your social station. This housing, built in Glasgow a hundred years ago for working men, was the best in the world, the envy of all those lesser nations. So not only could Britannia rule the wave, but she could make every Briton live like a prince as well. But maybe nations grow weary when they reach those heights. Maybe there's a time clock that runs through a nation so that each new generation, instead of making a fresh beginning, simply grows older and more tired. People still live in these blocks, and they wait for the state to house them elsewhere. And the state, whether it's the socialists who want to change everything, or the conservatives who may want to change nothing, is waiting too. For the state has run out of money, and it's running out of time, and running out of confidence, and maybe running out of friends as well. <laughs> 